Boccaccio's Decameron, second day, ninth story, and rather intense sunlight this morning. Elijah's touching tale being at an end and her duty done, their queen, the tall and lovely Philomena, then, whom none possessed more pleasing and cheerful a countenance, composed herself and said, the contract we made with Dianeo must be honored. And since only he and I are left to speak, I shall tell my story first. And Dianeo, who laid special claim to that privilege, will be the last to address us. And having said this, she began as follows. There is a certain proverb, frequently to be heard on the lips of the people, to the effect that a dupe will outwit his deceiver, a saying that would seem impossible to prove but for the fact that it is borne out by actual cases. And therefore, dearest ladies, I would like, without overstepping the limits of our theme, to show you that the proverb is indeed true, nor should you find my story unpalatable, for it will teach you to be on your guard against deceivers. A number of prosperous Italian merchants were once staying at the same inn in Paris, a city which people of their sort frequently have caused to visit for one reason or another. One evening, after they had all dined merrily together, they began talking about this and that, and one subject led to another, and they eventually came round to discussing the women folk they had left behind in Italy. I don't know what my wife gets up to, one, laughed one of them, but I do know this that whenever I meet a girl here in Paris who takes my fancy, I have as much fun with her as I can manage and forget about my wife. I do the same, said a second man, because whether or not I believe my wife is behaving herself, she will be making the most of her opportunities, so it's a case of tit for tat. Um, do as you would be, do as you would be done by, that's my motto, a third man was of more or less similar opinion, and indeed it looked as though they were unanimous in agreeing, in agreeing that the women that they had left behind would not be allowing the grass to grow under their feet. Only one of them, a Genoese called Bernabo Lumlin, took a different line, maintaining that he, on the contrary, was blessed with a wife who was possibly without equal in the whole of Italy. For not only was she endowed with all the qualities of the ideal woman, but she also possessed many of the accomplishments to be found in a knight or an esquire. She was extremely good looking and still very young. She was lithe and lesum, and there was no womanly pursuit such as silk embroidery that, and the like in which she did not outshine all other members of her sex. Furthermore, he claimed, it was impossible to find a page or servant who waited better or more efficiently at a gentleman's table, for she was a paragon of intelligence and good manners and the very soul of discretion. He then turned to her other accomplishments, praising her skill at horse riding, falconry, reading, writing, and bookkeeping, at all of which she was superior to the average merchant. And finally, after a series of further eulogies, he came round to the subject they were discussing, stoutly maintaining that she was the most chaste and honest woman to be found anywhere on earth. Consequently, even if he stayed away for 10 years or the rest of his life, he felt quite certain that she would never play fast and loose with another man's company. Among the people present at the discussion were a, there was a young merchant from Piacenza called Ambrogliolo, who, on hearing the last of Bernabo's laudatory assertions about his lazy lady, began roaring with laughter and jokingly asked him whether it was the emperor himself who had granted him this unique privilege. Faintly annoyed, Bernabo replied that this favor had been conceded to him not by the emperor but by God, who was a little more powerful than the emperor. Then. Ambrogliolo said, Bernabo, I do not doubt for a moment that you believe what you say to be true, but as far as I can judge, 
You have not devoted much attention to the study of human nature, for I, for if you had, you surely possess enough intelligence to have discovered certain things that would cause you to think twice before making such confident assertions. When the rest of us spoke to, uh, so freely about our women folk, we were merely facing facts, and so as not to let you run away with the idea that we suppose our wives to be any different from yours, I would like to pursue this subject a little further with you. I have always been told that a man is most noble of God's cre mortal, mortal creatures, and that woman comes second. Moreover, man is generally considered the most perfect, and the evidence of his work confirms this to be so. Being more perfect, it is inevitably follows that he is a stronger will, and this too is confirmed by the fact that women are invariably more fickle, the reasons for which are to be found in certain physical factors which I do not propose to dwell upon. Man then is the stronger will, yet quite apart from being unable to resist any woman who makes advances to him, he desires any woman he finds attractive, and not only does he desire her, but he will do everything in his power to possess her. And this is how he carries on, not just once a month, but thousands of times a day. What chance then do you think a woman, fickle by nature, can have against all entreaties that, and blandishments? the presence and the thousands of other expedients to which any intelligent lover will resort, do you think she's going to resist him? Of course not. And you know it. No matter what you claim to the contrary. Why, you told us yourself that your wife is a woman made of flesh and blood like the rest, in which case her desires are no different from any other woman's, and her power to resist these natural cravings cannot be any greater. So that, however virtuous she may be, it's quite possible that she acts like all the others. And whenever a thing is possible, one should not discount it prematurely or affirm its opposite as you are doing. Bernabo's reply was brief and to the point. I'm a merchant, not a philosopher, he said, and I shall give you a merchant's answer. I am well aware that the sort of thing you describe can happen in the case of foolish women who are without any sense of shame. But the more judicious ones are so eager to safeguard their honor that they become stronger than men who are indifferent to such matters. And my wife is one of these. If, of course, said Ambrogliolo, a horn bearing witness to their things were to sprout from their heads whenever they were unfaithful, then I think that the number of unfaithful women would be small. Not only do they not grow any horns, however, but the judicious ones leave no visible trace of their activities. There can't be any shame or loss of honor without clear evidence, and so, if they can keep it a secret, either they get on with it, or they desist because they are weak in the head. You can rest assured that the only chaste woman is either one who never received an improper proposal or one who, whose own proposals were always rejected. Even though I know that there are cognate and logical arguments to support this assertion, I would not be spelling it out with so much confidence were it not for the fact that I have often had occasion to prove it for myself with any number of women. And I will tell you this, that if it were anywhere near uh, this ever so saintly lady of yours, that if I were, if I were, anywhere near this ever so faintly lady of, saintly lady of yours, I shouldn't think it would take me long to lead her where I have led others in the past. We could go on arguing like this to an in indefinitely, said Bernabo who was, by this time, thoroughly incensed. You would say one thing, I would say another, and in the end, we would get precisely nowhere. But since you claim that they are all so compliant and that you are so clever, I'm prepared to order, prepared in order to convince you of my lady's integrity to place my head on the block if you ever persuade her to meet her wishes in this respect. And if you don't succeed, all I want you to lose is a thousand gold florins. Bernabo, replied Ambrogliolo, who was warming his subject. I wouldn't know what to do with your head if I were to win. But if you really want to see proof of what I have been saying, you can put up five thousand florins of your own, 
which is less than you'd pay for a new head, against my thousand. And whereas you did not fix any term, I will undertake to go to Genoa and have my way with this lady of yours within three months from a day. I leave Paris. By way of proof, I shall return with some of her most intimate possessions, and I shall furnish you with so many relevant particulars that you will be forced to admit the truth of it with your own lips. Make one condition, however. I make one condition, however. And that is that you promise me on your word of honor neither to come to Genoa during this period nor to give her any hint in your letters of what is afoot. Bernabo declared himself to be quite satisfied with these terms, and however much the other merchants pre present, knowing that the affair could have some serious repercussions, tried to prevent it from going any further. The passion of the two men were so strongly aroused that contrary to the wishes of the others, they drew up a form of contract with their own hands, which was binding on both parties. When the bond was sealed, Bernabo remained in Paris while Ambrogliolo came by the quickest possible route to Genoa. Having discovered where the lady lived, he spent the first few days after his arrival in making discreet inquiries about her way of life, and since the information he gathered more than confirmed the description he had been given by Bernabo, he began to feel he was on a fool's errand. However, he became friendly with the poor woman who regularly visited the house and enjoyed the lady's deep affection. Being unable to persuade her to assist him in any way, other way, he bribed her to lay, have him take him, taken inside a chest. Sorry, taken into the house inside a chest, made according to his own specifications, which found its way not only into the house but into the lady's very bedroom. Following in Bragliogos and in Brogliolo's instructions, the good woman pretended that it was on its way to some other place and obtained the lady's permission to leave it for a day or two in her room for safe keeping. When night had descended and in Brogliolo was satisfied that the lady was asleep, he prized the chest open with certain tools of his and stepped silently forth into the room where a single lamp was burning. He then began, by the light of the lamp, to inspect the arrangement of the furniture, the paintings, and everything else of note that the room contained and committed it all to memory. People almost never left lamps burning. That was an incredibly expensive thing to do. But you need some way for him to see, don't you? Next, having approached the bed, and found the lady with little, with a little girl beside her, both soundly asleep. He uncovered her from the head to toe, and saw that she was every bit as beautiful, without any clothes, as when she was fully dressed. But her body contained no unusual mark of any description, except for the fact that below her left breast, there was a mole surrounded by a few strands of fine golden hair. Having noted this, he silently covered her up again, Although on seeing how beautiful she was, he was sorely tempted to hazard his life and lie down beside her. However, having heard tales of her unbending strictness and her violent distaste for that sort of thing, he decided not to risk it. Roaming about the room at his leisure for, the most, of, for most of the night, he removed a purse and a long cloak from a strong box, together with some rings and one or two ornamental belts all of which he stowed away in the chest before retiring into it himself and clamping down the lid again from the inside. And in this way, he spent two whole nights there without the lady noticing that anything was amiss. The good woman following his instructions returned on the morning of the third day for her chest and had it taken back to his original place. And Brogliolo let himself out and having paid the woman the the sum he had promised her, he hurried back to Paris with his ill-gotten gains. Arriving well within the agreed time limit, he then called together the merchants who had been at discussion when the bets were placed, and in Bernabo's presence he announced that since he had made good his boast, he had won the wager by way of proof. He began by describing the shape of the bedroom and the pictures it contained. Then he showed them the things he had brought back with him, claiming that they had been given to him by the lady herself. Bernabo conceded that his description of the room was correct, and furthermore, he admitted that he did indeed recognize the exhibits as having once belonged to his lady. 
but he pointed out that Ambrogliolo could have learnt about the arrangements of the room from one of the servants and obtained these objects in similar fashion. So that, unless further evidence was forthcoming, he did not feel that the claim was substantiated. In all conscience, in all conscience, this should have been quite sufficient, Ambrogliolo retorted. But since you want me to provide further evidence, I will do so. And I will tell you just below her left breast, your wife, Zenevra, has a sizable little mole surrounded by about half a dozen fine golden hairs. When Bernabo heard this, he felt as though he had been stabbed through the heart. Such was the pain that assailed him. His whole face changed so that even if he had not uttered a word, it would have been quite obvious that Ambrogliolo had, what Ambrogliolo said was true. Gentlemen, he said after a long pause, what Ambrogliolo says is true, and therefore, since he has won the wager, he may come whenever he likes in order to collect his due. And the next day, Ambrogliolo was paid in full. Bernabo left Paris and hurrying back to Genoa with the murder in his heart. But as he was approaching his destination, he decided to go no further. Halting instead at an estate of his some 20 miles from the city, he then sent a retainer of his whom he greatly trusted to Genoa with two horses and a letter telling his wife he had returned and asking her to come and join him under the, men, the man's escort. And he secretly instructed the servant that on, that on reaching the most suitable place, he was to kill her without showing any mercy and return to him alone. When the retainer reached Genoa, he land, handed over the letter and delivered his master's message, being welcomed by the lady with great rejoicing. And next morning, they mounted their horses and set out for Bernabo's estate in the country. As they were riding along together, conversing on various topics, they came to a very deep ravine, a lonely spot with a precipitous crags and trees all around it, which seemed to the retainer the ideal place to carry out his master's orders without any risk of detection. He therefore drew his dagger and seized the lady's arm, saying, Command your soul to God, my lady, for this is the place where you must die. On seeing the dagger and hearing these words, the lady was completely terror-stricken. For God's sakes, have mercy, she cried. Before putting me to death, tell me what I ever did to you, that you should want to kill me. My lady, he replied, to me you have never done anything, but you must have done something or other to your husband, for he ordered me to kill you without mercy in the course of our journey. And if I fail to carry out his instructions, he has threatened to have me hanged by the neck. You know very well how much I depend upon him, and how impossible it would be for me to disobey him. God knows I feel sorry for you, but I have no alternative. The lady began to weep. weep. Oh, for the love of God, have mercy, she said. Don't allow yourself to murder someone who never did you any harm. Just for the sake of obeying an order, as God is my witness, I have never given my husband the slightest cause for taking my life. But leaving that aside, you have, have it and within your power to satisfy your master without offending God or laying a finger upon me. All you have to do is to take these outer garments I am wearing and leave me a cloak and a doublet. You can then return to our Lord and Master with the clothes and tell him you have killed me. And I swear to you upon the life you, have, you will have granted me that I will disappear and go away somewhere so that neither he nor you nor the people of these parts will ever hear of me again. The retainer was by no means eager to kill her and was easily moved with compassion. And so, having taken the clothes, he gave her a tatted old double of his and the cloak to put on, left her some money she was carrying, and begged her to disappear entirely from those, those parts. He then abandoned her in the valley on foot and returned to his master, informed, informing him that not only had his orders been carried out, but he had left her dead body surrounded by a pack of wolves. Sometimes afterwards, Bernabo returned to Genoa, but once the story had leaked out, he never succeeded in living it down. The lady, abandoned and forlorn, disguised herself as best she could, and when it was dark, she went to a nearby cottage where she obtained some things from an old woman and altered the doublet and shortened it to make it fit 
She also converted the shift into a pair of knee-length breeches, cut her hair, and having transformed her appearance completely so that she now looked like a sailor, she made her way down the coast where she happened to encounter the master of a ship lying some distance offshore, a Catalan gentleman by, called Senor El Carach, who had come ashore at Albenga to take on supplies of fresh water. Engaging him in conversation, she persuaded him to sign her on as a cabin boy, calling himself Sucrano da Finale. And once they had gone aboard, the gentleman supplied her with some smarter clothes to wear, and she served him so well and so efficiently that he grew very attached to her. Now it so happened that not long afterwards, the Catalan docked in Alexandria with a cargo, which included some peregrine falcons that he was taking to the Sultan. These he duly delivered, after which he occasionally invited he was occasionally invited to dine at the royal table, and the Sultan, on observing the ways of Sucrano, who was still in attendance upon him, was greatly impressed with the youth and asked the Catalan if he would allow him to keep him. Although he was loath to let him go, the Catalan gave his consent, and it was not very long before Sicrano's able performance of his duties had earned him the same degree of favor and affection that the Sultan had enjoyed with his previous master or sorry, with this form of the sultan that he had enjoyed with his previous master. Now, at a certain season of the year, it was a custom to hold a trade fair within the sultan's domain of Accra, where merchants, both Christian and Saracen, used to congregate in large numbers, and in order to protect the merchants and their merchandise, the sultan always used to send, in addition to other officials, one of his court dignitaries with a contingent of guardsmen, and so it was that when the time for the fair drew near, the sultan thought that he would send Sicrano in discharge to discharge his function, as he had already had an excellent knowledge of the language, and this he did. Sicrano duly arrived at Accra. Therefore, as captain in charge of the special guard, his, whose duties were to protect the merchants and their merchandise, as he went round on tours of inspection, discharging his functions with, the diligence, with diligence and skill, he came across a number of merchants from Sicily, Pisa, Genoa, Venice, and other parts of Italy, with whom he readily made friends out of nostalgic feeling for their country of his birth. Now, it so happened that on one of these occasions, having dismounted at the stall of some Venetian merchants, in the midst of various other valuable objects, he caught sight of a purse and an ornamental belt, which he promptly recognized as his own former belongings. Concealing his astonishment, he politely asked who owned them and whether they were for sale. One of the merchants attending the fair was Ambrogliolo of Piacenza, who had arrived there on a Venetian ship with a large quantity of goods, and on hearing that the captain of the guards was asking who owned the articles in question, he stepped forward, grinning all over his face. Sir, he said, these things belong to me, and they are not for sale. But if you like them, I will gladly make you a present of them. When Sicarano saw him laughing, he suspected that the fellow had somehow seen through his disguise, but keeping a straight face, he asked, Why do you laugh? Is it because you see me, a soldier, inquiring about these female commodities? No, sir, replied Ambrogliolo. That is not the reason I am laughing about the way I acquired them. Oh, said Sicarano. Then perhaps, if the explanation is not too improper, you will do, you will be good enough to tell us about it. Sir, replied Ambrogliolo, these things were given to me, along with various others, by a gentlewoman of Genoa called Donna uh, Zinevra, the wife of Bernabo Lumulin. It was after I had slept with her for the night, and she asked me to keep them as a token of her love. And I was laughing just now because I was reminded of the foolishness of her husband. He was insane enough to wager 5,000 florins against 1,000 that I would not succeed in seducing this lady. I won the wager, of course, and I am given to understand that the husband, who should have pushed, punished himself for stupidity instead of punishing his wife for doing what all other women do, returned from Paris to Genoa and had her put to death. On hearing these words, Sicarano understood at once why Bernabo had been so enraged with her and realized that this was the fellow who was responsible for her woes. 
and she vowed to herself that he would not go unpunished. Sicarano therefore pretended to be greatly amused by his story and skillfully, skillfully cultivated his friendship so that when the fair was over, Ambrogliolo packed up all his goods and at Sicarano's invitation went with him to Alexandria where Sicarano had a warehouse built for him and placed a large sum of money at his disposal. And Ambrogliolo, seeing that it was greatly to his profit, was only too ready to stay there. Being anxious to often offer Bernabo clear proof of his wife's innocence, Sicarano never rested until, with the assistance of one or two influential Genoese merchants in the city and a variety of ingenious pretexts, he had enticed him to come to Alexandria. Bernabo was by now in a state of poverty, and Sicarano secretly commissioned some of his friends to shelter him and keep him out of the way until such time as he felt he could cut his plans into effect. Sicarano had already persuaded Ambrogliolo to repeat his story in front of the Sultan, who, was, who had greatly relished it. But now that Bernabo had arrived, he wanted to see the business through as quickly as possible, and took the earliest opportunity to induce the Sultan to summon Ambrogliolo and Bernabo to his presence, so that in Bernabo's hearing, Ambrogliolo could be coerced by fair means or foul to confess the truth concerning his boast with regard to Bernabo's wife. So Ambrogliolo and Bernabo duly appeared before the Sultan, who glared fiercely at Ambrogliolo and ordered him to tell the truth about the manner in which he had won the 5,000 gold florins from Bernabo. Among the many people present was Sicrano, whom Ambrogliolo trusted more than anybody, but Sicarano glared even more fiercely at him and threatened him with dire tortures if he refused to speak out. Ambrogliolo was therefore terrified whichever way he looked, and after being subjected to a little further persuasion, to a little further persuasion not anticipating any punishment other than the, the restitution of the 5,000 gold florins and the articles he had stolen, he described in detail to Bernabo and all the others present exactly what had happened. No sooner had he finished speaking than Sicarano, acting as though he were the Sultan's public prosecutor, rounded on Bernabo. And you, he said, what was your reaction to these falsehoods concerning your lady? I was overcome with rage at the loss of my money, replied Bernabo, and also with shame at the damage to my honor that I thought my wife had committed. And so I had her killed by one of my retainers, and according to his own account, she was immediately devoured by a pack of wolves. Sicarano then addressed the sultan, who, thought, who though he had been listening carefully and taking it all in, was still in, a, in the dark about Sicarano's motives in requesting the, and arranging this meeting. My lord, he said, it will be quite obvious to you what a fine swain and a fine husband that good lady was blessed with, for the swain deprives her of her honor by besmirching her good name with lies, at the same time ruining her husband, and the husband paying more attention to another man's falsehoods than to the truth that years of experience should have taught him has killed her, has her killed and eaten by wolves. Moreover, both the suitor and the husband and the husband love and respect her so deeply that they are able to spend a long time in her company without ever recognizing her. But in order that you shall be left in no possible doubt concerning the merits of these two gentlemen, I am ready, provided that you will grant me the special favor of pardoning the dupe and punishing the deceiver, to make the lady appear here and now before your eyes. The Sultan, who was prepared to allow Sicarano a completely free hand in this affair, gave his consent and told him to produce the lady. Bernabo, being firmly convinced that she was dead, was unable to believe his ears while Ambrogliolo, for whom things were beginning to look desperate, was afraid in any case that he was going to have more than a sum of money to pay and could not see that it would affect him either one way or the other if the lady really did turn up. But, if anything, he was even more astonished than Bernabo. No sooner had the Sultan agreed to Sicarano's request than Sicarano burst into tears and threw himself on his knees at the Sultan's feet. And, at the same time, losing his manly voice 
and the desire to persist in his masculine role? My lord, he said, I myself am the poor unfortunate Zenerva, and Zenevra, who for six long years has toiled her way through the world disguised as a man, a victim of the false and wicked calumnies of this traitor Ambrogliolo, and on the inquisitous cruelty of this man who handed her over to be killed by one of his servants and eaten by wolves. Tearing open the front of her dress and displaying her bosom, she made it clear to the Sultan and to everyone else that she was indeed a woman. Then she rounded on Ambrogliolo, haughtily demanding to know when he had ever slept with her, as he had claimed. But Ambrogliolo, seeing who it was, simply stood there and said nothing, as though he were too ashamed to open his mouth. The sultan, who had always believed her to be a man, was so astonished on seeing and hearing all this that he kept thinking that he must be dreaming and that his eyes and ears were deceiving him. But once he had recovered from his astonishment, he realized that it was true. He lauded um, Zenevra um, to the skies for her virtuous way of life, her constancy, and her strength of character, and having ordered women's clothes of the finest quality to be brought and provided her, with a retinue of ladies, he complied with her earliest re earlier request and spared Bernabo from the death he assuredly deserved. On recognizing his wife, Bernabo threw himself in tears at her feet, asking her forgiveness, and although he merited no such favor, she graciously conceded it and helped him up again, clasping him in a fond and wifely embrace. The Sultan next commanded that Ambrogliolo should instantly be taken to some upper part of the city, tied to a pole in the sun, smeared with honey, and left there until he fell of his own accord. And this was done. He then decreed that all of Ambrogliolo's possessions, which amounted in value to more than 10,000 doubloons, should be handed over to the lady. And for his own part, he put on a splendid feast, at which Bernabo, being Lady Zenevra's husband, and the most excellent Lady Zenevra herself, were the guests of honor. And in addition, he presented her with jewels, gold, and silver plate, and money, all of which came to a further 10,000 doubloons in value. He meanwhile commissioned a ship to be specially fitted out for their use, and once the feast he held in their honor was concluded, he gave them leave to return to Genoa whenever it suited their purpose. And when they sailed into Genoa, weak with joy and laden with riches, a magnificent welcome awaited them, especially Lady Zenevra, whom everybody had thought to be dead, and thereafter, for as long as she lived, she was held in high esteem and regarded as a paragon of virtue. And as far Ambrogliolo, on, that, on the very day that he was tied to the pole and smeared with honey, he was subjected to excruciating torments by the mosquitoes, wasps, and horn flies, which abound in that country. And not only was he slain, but every morsel of his flesh was devoured. Hanging by their sinews, his whitened bones remained there for ages without being moved. An eloquent testimony of his wickedness to all who beheld them, and thus it was that the dupe outwitted the deceiver. <laughs> Ouch. A um, couple things about it. If you are a big fan of Shakespeare, um, you would recognize this as um, nearly the identical plot of Cimberline. Um, Shakespeare undoubtedly read Boccaccio, but we think that Cimberline was actually adapted from a translation of Boccaccio. Um, there is this um, Frederick of Genin, who, you know, which was written by a German author, have, you know, so basically Shakespeare is translating, you know, is adapting from a German author who is a, adapting from Boccaccio. Um, you know, Boccaccio's tremendously influenced. You, you're going to find Boccaccio's story showing up all over the place in other artists. Um, the other thing that's interesting is, in this case, the Saracen um, Sultan is very much the benevolent judge. You see at this time that, you know, Boccaccio, you know, Muslims are not, you know, whitewashed, uh, you know, with this broad paint as, you know, they're all evil, they're all, you know, Saracens, they're all, you know, worship Muhammad and all this stuff. You know, definitely you see that, you know, Muslims are treated as people. In this case, you know, the, the Sultan is a very benevolent judge 
and he is very much concerned with establishing justice, not just in his land, but for crimes committed outside of it. So, interesting piece of work there. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I will um, see you later. Bye-bye.